Cool. Um, so I have to say something about 2-2 two, two before we finish 2-3. And then hopefully we'll finish 2-3. Um, I think what we have left isn't going to take all class, maybe. It also depends on how many questions you'll have. But anyway, um, so we're going to try to get through, well, we are going to get through the rest of 2-3. Who did that? Just try to tell me that I didn't see. Oh, no. well. Let me know if things are weird. Anyway, um, so we'll get through the rest of 2-3, and hopefully there will be some time at the end um, to kind of talk about the exam and possibly answer your questions about the homework or just topics that you're struggling with. So um, let's get started, I guess, so that hopefully we can have that time at the end. Um, so there was one thing that apparently snuck its way on the homework, even though I tried to avoid it because we didn't go over it. Um, but so then it's, I think it's only on one question though. But so I want to talk about it so you know what it means. Um, where was I going to put this? I was going to put this kind of down here. So we had talked about all these different symbols for sets, the, um, you know, the intersection, the union, the complement, the power set, the, sorry, my hair is being weird. Complement, um, all that jazz. There is one more that we didn't talk about that I guess is in your book and also, again, snuck its way onto one question of your homework. And that's something that looks like, um, oh, I always forget which way it goes. I think it goes this way. It's kind of like A slash B or set slash another set. <laughs> so essentially what this is called set minus or sometimes set difference, people will call it. Essentially what this means, it's going to be um, essentially all of the elements such that X is in A, but X is not in B. And just note that this is simply for that one question on your homework. It's not going to pop up on your exam or anything, but just so that you uh, you know where it's coming from when you hit that homework question. And I apologize. Um, I That one slipped past um, my brain when I was assigning it. So essentially, let's look back at these sets really quick just to talk about the set minus between these two. So say I wanted to actually find A set minus B, the things that are in A but not in B. Well, the only two things that they share are three and five. So the things that are in A that are not in B, in our case for these sets A and B, would just be one and seven. It doesn't have anything to do with the rest of elements of B. It just has to do with all of the elements of A that are not in B. Um, so that's what the set minus would be. So again, that pops up on, I believe, just one question on your homework. Um, so now you know what it is. <laughs> Questions, concerns on that before we jump over to finishing two, three notes. Oh. Okay. So let's pop over to two, three, and then hopefully, goodness, really, Teams must have updated because things are in all different places. Uh, where'd my one, three notes go? Two, three notes go. There we go. So on Thursday, we started talking about two, three, which is about functions. So we did a couple definitions. We defined the domain, the codomain, the range, and we drew an example of a function. Remember, we don't always have to used kind of all of our all of our things so like in this function that we drew we didn't use d and e at all so d and e would be considered in the codomain but not in the range and then we defined um well defined <laughs> but then we didn't get to talk about it anymore so we're going to start there so to remind us of the definition so we have a function is called well defined if f of x has a value for every x in the domain, and if a equals b, then f of a equals f of b for any a and b in the domain. In other words, each input has an output, so it has an output, and one input does not have two different outputs. So essentially a well-defined function, every input has an output, and every input only has one output. So when is a function not well-defined instead of just regular old well-defined. 
So there's kind of two cases because you've got two things that make something well defined. You've got the fact that um, every uh, I've forgotten the word every input has to have an output, so it's not going to be defined if for some X in the domain. Some X in the domain X does not. Have a Y in the codomain to which to map to. So essentially you have an input that doesn't have an output. Or you could have some X in the domain X such that um, X has two different. Y's in the codomain for which to map to. So essentially this one. Whoop. Let me kind of write this down in a bit more. Basic English, so one input. At least one maybe has no output. And one input. Has. At least. Two outputs. It could have more than two outputs, but for it to be bad, it has to have at least two outputs, so that would be what makes it not well defined if you have a input that has no output or you have an input that has at least two outputs. So say we have the following um, going to be two. You can only see one so far. <laughs> so say we're going to look at these following functions and we want to determine if they're well defined or not. Now sometimes you can kind of just talk yourself through it, especially with um, part two of this one because it's more contextual. But with more generic functions where you're given a function, what we're going to do is we're going to assume essentially that we have two x values that equal each other. Now, if you, well, I should say inputs. We have two inputs that equal each other, and our inputs are looking like some x over y. I don't know why that seems in when I do that. And then we're going to show, hopefully, that these y values are the same. Because if you think about it, every input is going to have an output. No matter what I plug into that, this equation is going to spit me out an answer. There's no way for me to give you an X over a Y, not get an answer out of it. So we've already kind of satisfied that first thing that every input has to have an output because no matter what I plug in there, I have a function that tells me what my output is. So since I have that function, I have that equation there. I'm pretty much set up for every input has an output. So now I want to show that no input has two outputs. So I want to show that if the inputs are the same, that their outputs must be the same as well. Hopefully that made sense. So essentially, the fact that we have an equation gets us that all the inputs have an output, so we don't we aren't in the situation of number one, so we don't have any input that doesn't have an output. And now we want to check this one. So since we want to check that one, we're going to show that two equivalent inputs must actually go to the same output. So how are we going to do that? So if I wanted to be formal, I would say let A over B and C over D be rational numbers. Why are they rational? Because that's where my function is going from. It's going from the rational numbers to the rational numbers. So let them be rational numbers such that A over B equals C over D. And now let's play around with the Y values and see if we can actually show that they're equivalent. So let's start with, I should stop saying Y values, the output value here. Sorry, I'm so used to saying X and Y's in my calculus class. The output, let's play around with the outputs and see if we can make sure that they're the same. So if we look at the output for the F of A over B piece, if we use our formula, that's going to turn into A plus 3B over B. So now let's try to just algebraically manipulate this a little bit and try to see, um, play around with it a little bit and see if we can use this idea that A over B equals C over D um, to be able to get us what we want. Well, one thing I could do here is since I only have one thing in the denominator, I can essentially break this up so that that denominator goes to each piece in the numerator separately. 
And I gotta remember that. So I have this up on three screens today instead of two, and that screen lags way more than this one. So I always go off of that one because people might have it lagging as much as this one. Okay, that one's good now. So I can split it up <laughs> in kind of two pieces. And now if I just think a little bit, I have 3B over B, which essentially means that those Bs are going to cancel each other out. So I'll have A over B plus 3. So now I'm trying to get to something that's in terms of C and D, but what I've got so far is now I've got is A over B, and I know that that's going to be equivalent to C over D. So I can essentially replace that. So if I kind of use my relationship between the two and say, okay, well, A over B is equal to C over D, so I can go ahead and replace that in there. And maybe I should come off to the side. Maybe I should have done this first, but you know. What we want is we essentially want to find this C plus 3D over D because we want to show that these two things are equivalent. So if I start with my F of A over B, I want to somehow turn it into this F of C over D. Maybe that would have helped people figure out why I'm doing some of this. So I've got the C over D piece now, but I still need 3D over D. But think about the fact that anything over itself is one. So since anything over itself is one, I could rewrite that at whoops, not equals plus as three D over D. Like I essentially multiplied the three by D over D and then just pushed the three to the numerator. These are equivalent because D over D is just one. And then I can essentially since they have a common denominator, you can shove them together. This is exactly f of c over d. So what I've now shown is I've shown that the output for a of b equals the output of c and d. So I've shown that this is well defined. So let me just sum that up in a sentence. So then a over b equals c over d, then f of a over b equals f of c over d. So f is well defined. So now I've essentially taken care of showing that that kind of other piece is not happening here. I just showed that two equivalent inputs. <laughs> now it might say it might sound weird for me to say two equivalent inputs. I'm essentially saying if they're the same thing, think of like one half versus two fourths. They're technically the same thing. They shouldn't go to different numbers. And that's essentially what we've just shown here is that if the inputs are technically equivalent, then so are the outputs. And that is one of the necessary things to be a well defined function. Every input has to have an output which we know is true because we have a function here. If we have a function, it tells us what our output is. <laughs> so that was taken care of just by the fact that we had a function. And then every input can only go to one output. It was taken care of essentially this work right here. So if you ever want to show that a function is well defined, you can assume that every input has an output if you have a function, if you have an equation. And then you just have to essentially say, let me take two inputs that are the same, which is why we said let C, let A over B be equal to C over D, and then you have to show that their outputs are the same. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm really starting to hate teaching to a screen because I can't see faces and whether or not you're looking at me like I have five heads. Questions, concerns on that? Okay. What about this more contextual one? So I'll try to leave uh, maybe that much in there. So now let's look at a function u. Nope, that's not the function. I'm sorry, f is the function. So let u be the set of all students at USC, and let l be the set of all languages, so English, Spanish, Japanese, etc. 
that are taught at USC. And suppose we have this function um, between the students to the languages such that if we say f of u, that's going to be the language that that student u studies. So if I say if I was a student at USC and I was studying German, then f of Aaron would equal German. <laughs> OK, so it's not quite a generic equation, but we still have kind of this function between the two. So we need to look at two things. Every input, maybe I should put a question mark, has an output. Well, I guess I can put a question mark at the end. Does every input have an output? Does every person at USC study a language? And maybe I'm not completely savvy to all of the classes y'all need to take, but I'm pretty sure everyone eventually has to take a foreign language. Um, or take an English class as you know a gen ed. So yes, every student is going to study at least one language class, even if it's just like an English lit class or something like that for a gen ed. Every student at USC is going to take some type of language class along the way. So does every input have only one output. So the way to kind of think about that, so this one, maybe I should be a bit more clear. Does every does every student study a language? And then this one in a bit more, you know, contextual terms to this, does every input have only one output? Does every student, every student, only study one language? Well, that's probably going to be no. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I can go out to USC students and find someone who has studied, well, not only, even if you have like someone who majors in Spanish. They've probably had to take an English gen ed, but there's also probably someone who's, you know, majoring in Spanish and minoring in French. For whatever reason, whatever floats their boat. So there's most likely at least, well, no, I can pretty much guarantee that there's at least one student out there who studies more than one language. So essentially, since there is at least there is at least I'm going to block this off a little bit. There is at least one student that studies two languages. So F is not well defined. Oops. So once again, for well-defined, every input has to have an output and every input only has one output. So if either of those two break, then it's not well-defined. It is much more often that essentially the second piece is going to break. Um, it's not very often that you'll see something where an input doesn't have an output. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's more likely that you'll be looking for um, kind of that second piece of does every input only have one output as opposed to the first piece. Not saying that that's never going to happen, but it happens a lot less. Questions, concerns about well defined? Okay. Moving on to our next idea then. Well, this one, this next definition is just kind of put in there so we know what it is. Um, and I kind of wish I didn't write that far down. Anyway, so the identity function Whoa, that didn't change on your screen though, so that just freaked out on my screen. Where, where's the thing I want? There it is. <laughs> so the identity function, which in this class is going to be written like this, kind 
kind of a one with a little subscript X. That's going to be on the set X to itself. It's always the same on to itself. And this is essentially going to be if you take this function. So think of this as just F. OK, that's just the function name. If you plug in X to this function, you're just going to get out itself. <laughs> it's essentially just something where you plug in something and you get exactly what you plugged in. So if you see the words identity fun function, that's what it's talking about. It's a function that spits out exactly what was put in. But our next kind of idea is this notion of one to one and on to functions. So we say that a function f, say we're going from x, some set x to some set y, is called injective or one to one. This one is more often used. Um, you won't often hear people say injective. Well, maybe if you're talking to mathematicians, um, certain mathematicians, I'll always say one to one. Um, they mean the same thing, and one to one is used way more often than injective. But anyway, a function is one to one if for all a and b in your essentially input set. If f of a equals f of b, then it must have been the case that a equals b. It's kind of like the opposite. No, I shouldn't say it like that. Proving it is kind of the opposite of what we were just doing for well-defined. For well-defined, we took that the two inputs were the same and showed that the outputs were the same. For one-to-one, -one, you essentially take two outputs that are the same and show that their inputs must have been the same. It's kind of like backwards. Sometimes you'll just write, you know, the number one dash one. Um, I usually use the words, um, but some people will write the numerical one. So in other words, every output has one input. So in a generic function, you can have multiple inputs going to the same output. Think of like x squared. x squared is a function, but if you plug in one, you get one, and if you plug in negative one, you also get one. So we had two separate inputs going to the same output. That's fine for a function, but if we want it to be one to one, every output can only have one input associated with it. And we're going to show we're going to go over an example of how to show that in a second. So we also say that a function is surjective. Or on to and this one is the more used verbiage here on to. If for all y in the codomain, there is an X in the set X such that F of X equals Y. Now this one, I will be quite honest, is harder to show, <laughs> but we will talk about it in a second. We'll see in an example. So in other words, every element in the codomain has an element, has an input, I should say, that maps to it. So I'll let people get that down really quick and then I'm going to scroll back to example one that we did on Thursday and kind of point something out about it. I'll let people get those words down really quick. A couple more seconds. So if we kind of go back to that, um, this example that we talked about on Thursday, there was this D and E that were not used. So since there are elements in the codomain that don't have things mapping to it, this is not onto because there's things in the codomain, the D and the E, that didn't essentially not get into the range. So another way you can think of onto, and I'll write this on the other screen in a second. So another way you can think of onto is does the codomain equal the range? And if they don't, then it's not onto. So these two sets are not the same. So this is not an onto function because there are some elements in the codomain that aren't in the range. Um, so let me write that down on the other screen and not have it up here. Do, do, do. So another way to think of onto 
is does the codomain equal the range? Okay. So eh, hopefully anyone who wanted to write that down has it down. Otherwise, tell me to scroll back up. <laughs> So say we want to determine if the following functions um, on the real numbers, so we're going to take the inputs of these to be real numbers, are one to one. So essentially what we'd want to do here is say we had some f of a equals f of b. We want to show does a equal b. Now this one, I kind of already mentioned this one, so I probably should have picked a different example. Um, this one's not going to be one to one. So you can essentially find a counter example. You can find a counter example to this, something so that the, the outputs are the same, but the inputs are not. So we can have a counter example here. Where say f of negative, let's go negative two even. Negative two equals f of two, because these equal four. But negative two does not equal two. So we have something where the y values are the outputs are the same, but the inputs were different. One other thing, if you have, you know, a graph for a function, so sometimes you won't have a graph or you'll have a contextual problem, so this doesn't always help. But if you have a graph, you can kind of look at it as, you know, think about a bunch of horizontal lines. If those horizontal lines would cross through the function more than once, which they would in pretty much all of the cases here, then it's not one to one. So we kind of have this idea of this horizontal line test. I don't really think it's an official test, if you will, but you can kind of think of it that way. If you have a graph, if you like were to draw a bunch of horizontal lines on it, does it pass through more than once? If it does pass through more than once, it's not one to one. So if it passes through more than once, that would be not one to one. But again, also sometimes you don't have the graph. So we do also need kind of this algebraic idea of if the Y values are the same, are the X values the same? So hopefully that made sense. So if you can find a counter example, give one. For part two, we have three X minus one. Now, if I were to graph that, uh, that would look something like this. <laughs> so a straight line, which is going to pass the horizontal line test. But again, that's not really official. You can't just say like passes the horizontal line test. So it's one to one. It's kind of more of just a, a way to kind of check yourself. So what we want to do here is we want to take some f of a equals f of b, and we want to show, once my pen starts working again, and we want to show that a equals b. Now we're going to do that generically. So if I have f of a, that'll look like some 3a minus 1, and then f of b will look like 3b minus 1. So I essentially take two outputs, set them equal to each other. And now I've got to try to do some algebra to hopefully get out to the fact that A equals B. So if I do some algebra, if I add one to both sides, both of those cancel each other out. I get 3A equals 3B. Divide both sides by 3. You get that A equals B. So this is 1 to 1. Let me make a side note. In a second, I'll let y'all catch up. <laughs> Other thing about teaching to a screen is I forget to let you guys write stuff down. Also, if you have questions, let me know. All right, so a side note, um, kind of an algebra reminder. Say you had uh, a squared equals b squared. This is not going to give you a equals b. <clears throat> Excuse me, my throat just got really dry. 
<clears throat> so that would not give you a equals b because essentially what you would need to do to solve this is you would need to take the square root of both sides but that ends up getting you essentially a plus minus. So remember, whenever you square root something, so extra side note, uh, say we had like a squared equals, I'll answer that in just a second, a squared equals four. Technically solving this would get you plus or minus two. So that's one thing that comes up a lot with one-to-one -one questions is um, if you're ever taking a, a square root make sure you have a plus minus because that most likely means that it's not one to one, which is essentially what's happening here. Is that just because a squared equals b squared does not equal does not mean that a equals b. Um, so be careful there um, with one to one if you're trying to solve it algebraically and you have like a square root or something like that. Question, are questions on exams going to be similar to the questions on the homework or are they going to be similar to the examples in the notes? Um, between those two options, I would say, examples in the notes, but also um, that's a good thing. If y'all didn't see this yet. Uh, uh, what do I want to click on? I guess just this. If y'all didn't see this yet. And I meant to mention it already. Well, I guess I was going to mention it after we finished the notes, but anyway, I'll mention it now. Do 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 do. There's a new folder. So there's a review here. Um, the first thing just essentially lists the topics that are fair game and then lists the uh, quite obnoxious amount of kind of things that we defined. <laughs> um, so that just kind of tells you all the things that are fair game, but then kind of probably more importantly, there's some problems. Um, now, I'll be honest, this got a little bit away from me when I was making it because uh, as you see, it's a, a, 11 pages, um, <laughs> which I didn't mean to make that that long, but there's just so much material that we covered. Um, so, of course, this is purely optional. You do not have to do this. It's not required, but I would suggest going through it because I would say the exam, um, which I haven't finished writing, but I have started writing, will reflect questions that look more like this than the homework. So they'll be um, more like the questions that show up here than than that. So I know it's a bit long. I'm really sorry about that. I'm going to get the answers up as soon as I can, um, which is just what you asked, Clark. So I haven't written the answers yet. I'm getting real behind on things. <laughs> it's going to be up as soon as I can. Hopefully that means tonight. Um, it might mean tomorrow morning, but I'm trying my very hardest to get those answers up to you guys tonight um, so you can uh, check your answers. So it is kind of long. Um, but maybe just focus on the things that you're struggling with and uh, that's going to be much better practice for the exam than your homework. Okay. So I'll talk about the exam a bit more probably once we finish these notes because we're working towards the end so we're actually somewhat almost there but anyway. So that's how you would check if functions are one to one. If you have a counterexample, give it. Otherwise, what you're going to want to do is, and even if you can't necessarily find counterexample right off the bat, if you think that it might be one to one, but you're not entirely sure, take two generic outputs, set them equal to each other, try to do some algebra to reduce it down to A equals B. If you can't get there, then it's not one to one. And if you can get there, then it is one to one. So, which is essentially what I just say right here. So note to show a function is one to one, we need to show that every output has only one input. This usually means we assume two outputs are the same and then show the inputs must be the same as well. New type of function that you may not have seen before, so maybe I don't know how often this is used in actual computer science classes or not. Anyway, we have this function here um, where note so the notation it's kind of like a little little absolute value sign, but with a foot, if you will. There's also this one, but we're not going to talk about that one. But if you have this function here, this is going to be called the floor function. So the other one would be called the ceiling function, if you're curious. But anyway, so the floor function. 
it's going to give the greatest integer less than or equal to the number that you're essentially plugging in, where X can be absolutely any real number. So you want to essentially find the greatest integer that is less than or equal to the value you care about. So say I want the floor of 2.7, which is what you'd say, floor of 2.7. So there's a bunch of integers that are less than 2.7. Uh, you know, 2, 1, negative 5, negative 1,000. There's a bunch of integers that are less than it. But what is the greatest integer that's less than it? That would be 2. So we want to specifically look at integer here. So what is the largest integer that is less than or equal to that number? The first, essentially the first integer once you start going below that number is 2, if that makes any sense, hopefully. So if we want the floor of negative 3.2, well, if you think about all the numbers that are less than negative 3.2, kind of the first integer that you're going to come to is negative 4. So you're going backwards on the number line. So no, negative numbers are, you know, they're numeric <laughs> behind the negative is getting larger as you go to the left, if you will. So negative 4 is going to be less than negative 3.2, and that is going to be the greatest integer essentially kind of that first integer, if you will, that's less than negative 3.2. Hopefully that made sense. <laughs> and then if I want the floor of eight. Now the floor of eight, well, eight is an integer, and that's where this equals to piece comes in, because we want it the greatest integer less than or equal to it. So since eight already is an integer, the floor of eight is just going to be eight. So if you ever want the floor of something, look at the numbers that are less than that, and specifically the integers that are less than that number, and pick the largest integer that is less than that number. So what we want to do now is we want to show that this floor function maps the real numbers onto Z. So essentially, we want to show that the function from the real numbers to the integers, essentially defined by this floor function, is onto. So this is an example of showing something is onto. And again, the onto one is. I don't necessarily want to say the harder one, but it, it is slightly more difficult to see, if you will. There's no like kind of nice visual like we had the horizontal line test. So here what we want to do is we want to show. So remind us what we want to do here. So we want to show. We want to show. <laughs> Essentially, we need to show that everything in the codomain gets mapped to. So we want to show that every integer has essentially something that will map to it. So we want to show that every integer, so let's say integer n, has a real number x that maps to it. Maybe let me try to say it one more way. Um, we want to find a real number um, such that you know the floor of that real number is going to give you n for any integer. Um, I probably phrased that very poorly. My for any is probably in the wrong spot. That for any should probably be in the front. For any integer find a real number. Yep, no, I'm going to rewrite that really quick. For any integer, there is a real number such that the floor of that real number equals that integer. OK, there we go. That phrasing is better. So we want to show that every integer has a real number such that the floor of that real number is going to be the integer. Now the thing with onto 
is that you don't need to worry about how many things are mapping to that. So there's actually going to be, a, in terms of the floor function, there's going to be a lot of things that will map to a specific integer. You know, if we start thinking about, you know, this first example here that gave us two, if I found the floor of 2.1, it would also be uh, two. If I found the floor of 2.5, it would also be two. If I found the floor of 2.9, it would be two. So there's a bunch of real numbers that map to a certain integer. We just want to show that there's at least one. So you don't care about how many things are mapping to that. You just want to show that there's at least one thing that maps to that output. So what we want to do is we want to let n be an integer. We essentially want to start with an output. How did this zoom in a little bit? So let me try to, since this one's I think the harder one to see, I'm going to try to keep notes along the way. So start with an output. Um, and then, well, I don't know how to find an input such that, if you'll let me abbreviate, um, the floor of that number equals n. So we're going to start with this input, sorry, start with this output, and we're going to now go and find an input such that the floor of that input is this n. Well, if you think think about it, the integers are a subset of the real numbers. Every integer is a real number. So that output, whatever that output number, I should say, is also going to be a real number. And since n is an integer, the floor of itself is going to be n. So we've just found an input that goes to n. It just happens to be itself in this specific case. So f would be on to. So essentially here, is where we found the output. Sorry, I keep mixing this up, where we found the input. So we started with our output. Oh, my camera's frozen. We started with our output. And I essentially went into the real numbers and found a real number such that the floor of that real number gave me that integer. It just happens to be the case that since the floor of an integer is itself, I can say, OK, well, then a real number that you know, the floor function gives me an integer is actually an integer. Hopefully that made sense. So you want to show something's onto. Let's scroll down just a bit. So to show something's onto, we must show that every output has an input that maps to it. This usually means we start with an output and then find an input that works. Essentially, go and find an input that will give you the output that you just were looking for. So again, that one's a bit more wishy-washy than one to one. One to one, you kind of like have this formula that you're starting with, and you're just kind of, excuse me, doing some algebra to manipulate it. And this one, you kind of just have to say, I'm going to start with an output, and now I have to go on an adventure, and I have to find my input that works. <sighs> okay. Questions, concerns? OK. So last page, so we'll probably have maybe not as much time as I thought. But we should have a, excuse me, goodness gracious, stop doing that. We should have a little bit of time um, at the end. We'll probably, this won't take too long, I hope. So. We say a function is bijective or a one-to-one -one correspondence. 
Now in this one, there's actually not one that's used more over the other. I actually probably say bijective for this one, um, which is funny because I don't say injective or surjective. But anyway, so a function is bijective or a one to work correspondence if it is both one to one and on to. So if you are asked to show that something is a one to one correspondence, you have to show that it's one to one and then you have to show that it's on to. So both one to one and on to. So essentially you use kind of those two different ideas from the examples we kind of just went over. Um, you just have to do both of them. Okay. So we're not going to do example of that um, because again, it's just the exact same processes as examples three and five. You just have to do them both separately. So next idea is something called function composition. So the composition of F and G is defined to be, um, I don't know, I usually read that as fog, but that's not the official way to read it. <laughs> so F composed with G is how you'd actually read it. Um, you might be more used to this notation. This is what I use almost 100% of the time, but since your book and your homework uses this notation, um, I'll use that notation in this class. But just know that if I accidentally write the other notation, it, it means the same thing. So essentially what this is saying here is, we're going to plug in the entire function g of x. f of g of x. Yeah, that's usually also how that's how I would read this notation. I never know how to read this notation in English. I guess no saying f of g would would be the same thing because they mean the same thing, but I usually just like to be an idiot and call it fog. But f of g. Is a perfectly fine way to say composition. So essentially we're taking g of x and plugging it in for wherever we see an x in the function f. So this is hopefully familiar to you. Maybe I should stop saying things like that. But anyway, so say we have two functions. We have x squared plus one as our f and g is x minus seven and we want to compute essentially both compositions, one in one way, one in the other way. So if I have f composed with g, so f of g of x. Um, one thing I like to do, I usually do this with my calc class, um, is you can sometimes do an intermediate step if you're not really great with these. So I'll just do it now in case people are either rusty or have never seen these before in their life. So one thing you can kind of do is you can replace that function with the actual equation. You don't necessarily have to do this. But essentially what this then tells me is I'm going to take X minus seven and put it everywhere I see an X and F. So that would mean I would have X minus seven all squared plus one. You don't have to do that intermediate step if you know how to jump from one side to the other. Um, but that intermediate step might be helpful. I don't know. Maybe it doesn't help at all. But essentially we're taking that function G of X and plugging it in everywhere we saw an X and F. Whereas if I go the way, if I compose G F, so G of F, if I want to do my little intermediate step again with a different color, let me replace F of X with the equation that it is. So I'm, oh, why? I really don't understand why that seems in random. So we'll have G of X squared plus one. So we're going to take X squared plus one and plug it in everywhere we see an X in the function G. So we would have X squared plus one minus seven. I always just take parentheses, the parentheses with me when I do compositions. Sometimes they're necessary, like in this first one, if you hadn't had the parentheses there, you would be wrong. Here, we kind of don't need the parentheses. We can kind of drop them if we want. We can even combine together that one minus seven to get negative six. And well, let's jump back up to this one too. If I wanted to expand out my top one, so I'd have to foil this piece because it's X minus seven times X minus seven. So I would get X squared minus 14 X plus 49. And then the plus one at the end from this. <laughs> 
And then of course you can combine this together uh, to be plus 50, but I kind of ran out of space. So I'll just leave it like that and have a little side note. Oh, my pen. So are these the same function? No, they're not. No, these are not the same function. So if you didn't already know, <laughs> the kind of opposite compositions, if you will, are not the same function. They're usually 99% of the time, 100% different. There are very rare cases where they could be the same thing. Not that I can think of one off the top of my head, but I'm sure there exists at least one. But anyway, so that's compositions. You're essentially plugging in the entire inside function into the outside function, if you will, where the inside function for the first one was g of x and the inside function for the second one was f of x. So you essentially work inside out. Questions, concerns on compositions? All right. Well, then there's one last thing we got to talk about, and that's called inverse functions. Also might be somewhat familiar to you. Maybe you've seen it before in your life. Maybe you haven't worked with them in a while. Maybe you haven't seen them at all. I'm going to stop babbling. So if f of x is one to one, so it has to be one to one for us to talk about an inverse function, then it has an inverse function. So if f is one to one, we have inverse, 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 yeah, function. I can't spell to save my life. And that S doesn't look like an S. The notation for this is essentially F and then a little power. I know I shouldn't phrase it like that. A little negative one of X. This is not, I, I was about to phrase it very badly. This is not a power. This is not F to the negative first. Um, actually, let me keep that in there. That's not a power, it's just notation. So essentially what this means is that for any y in the range of f, so any output of the original function, um, <laughs> we have these two things being true. Oops. Essentially, if you compose the inverse with itself and you plug in a value to that composition, you're just going to get out what you started with. So if we compose them together, plug something in, we're always going to get out what we started with when we plug something in. So how do you compute the inverse function? Well, the first thing is you might need to check that it's one to one. So don't find an inverse if you're not told that it's one to one. So what you're going to do, there's a couple different ways you can do this, but this is how I'm going to state it. We're going to start with y equals f of x. We're going to start by solving for x. Sometimes people will swap the variables first. If you like to do that, you like to swap the variables first and then solve, that's perfectly fine. But we're going to solve for x and then we're going to swap our variables. So we're going to switch x and y to essentially write the formula for the, uh, for the inverse. So let's see an example of that and then we'll be done to three. I have about 15 minutes left afterwards. So say we want to find the inverse of x to the fifth minus two. Check your work by evaluating the two compositions. Um, I'm going to do a quick side note about one to one, just to do one more example of that. So let's triple check. This is one to one. Oh my, I, I really don't know why that does that. So if I have some a to the fifth minus two, equals b to the fifth minus two. If I add two to both sides, I'm going to get a to the fifth equals b to the fifth, because this also brings up a decent thing. So I was rambling a couple minutes ago about how when you take the square root of something, you need a plus minus. Here we would want to take the fifth root of both sides to solve this. If you're taking an odd root, you don't need a plus minus. So if we take the fifth root of both sides, 
we don't need a plus minus because it's an odd root. So even root, you need a plus minus, but with odd roots, uh, no plus minus. So if this was the fourth root, the sixth root, the tenth root, we'd have to get a plus minus and then it wouldn't be one to one. But since it's an odd root that we'd be taking to solve this, odd roots do not pick up that kind of plus minus piece to it. So this is one to one. So anyway, so since it's one to one, we can find the inverse. Oh my God. So let's go ahead and do so. So I can think of this as y equals x to the fifth minus two. So I want to solve for x. I want to get x by itself. So I'm going to add two to both sides. And then I have to take the fifth root. Now that I've now that I've solved for X. We're going to essentially switch our variables. So all of our Y's will become X's and all of our X's will become Y's. And then just change it to inverse function notation. So that's how we'd find the inverse and now we were asked to essentially check that it is the inverse by essentially composing both of the things because if we compose them together then we should just get out x. So say I start with well questions concerns about finding the inverse first. Cool. So say I want to I don't know it doesn't matter which one I do first let me compose them this way first so this would be um, in the other notation uh, this. So essentially, I'm going to take my x to the fifth minus two and plug it into my inverse function. So we have the fifth root of x to the fifth minus two plus two. Those parentheses aren't really necessary, if you will, so I can drop them and then I can do the minus two plus two are going to cancel each other out. I'm just going to get x to the fifth x to the fifth to the fifth root. It's just x. Specifically because it's an odd root, because again, if it was an even root, we'd need a plus minus. And then again, you know what? We'll just I'm just going to go with it then. It's going to be this zoomed in. And then if we do the other way. So just other notation. Just, no. Just in case. So we're essentially taking the inverse function and plugging it in into the original. So we'd have the fifth root of x plus two to the fifth minus two. That little five for the root doesn't look like a five. The fifth root and the fifth power essentially cancel each other out so we just end up with x plus 2 minus 2 which just results in x so since these both resulted in x we know that they were inverses so now let me zoom back out so that entire picture the entire question gets in there zoom back out come on you can do it i trust and believe and now i wrote little things that i don't need to write Boink. and there we go questions concerns about inverse functions Savvy. Well, that's two, three, and we're obviously not going to go on to two, four because that's not on your exam. So we have about 15 minutes. I know the large majority of you haven't look, probably looked at your homework yet, which is fine. I'm not trying to be sassy. Um, but if anyone has any questions on the homework or you just want me to talk about um, the words, a topic that you're really struggling with, um, we got 15 minutes. If you want to leave, you can. We're done content for today, but I will stick around for these next 15 minutes and answer questions. Um, oh, 
Oh, maybe I want to talk about the exam really quick though. So again, I'm not completely done writing it yet. I can't remember how much I told you about it before, but I might have lied if I talked about it before. <laughs> so usually my exams have multiple choice and free response. Um, these topics don't lend themselves very easily to good multiple choice questions, so um, there aren't any. <laughs> but there are a large majority of questions that are very short answer. Like when we were talking about sets, it was asking for you to find um, the union or the intersection. Um, those are very hopefully quick questions. So most of these are kind of short answer. Um, there's also some kind of like true or false kind of ideas. Is this or maybe not true or false, but like is this a statement or is it not a statement? Is this true? Is this false? Um, is this a well defined function? Is this not? Um, and then so it's got a little bit of like true false feel to it. Then it's got a bunch of kind of short answer and then it does have some long answers. So there's you know truth tables. Um, I do ask you to prove a couple things, um, you know, contra position, that kind of idea. Again, look over that review thing that I posted. Um, that will be incredibly helpful in pointing you in the right direction. Um, what sections are on the exam? If you look at that topic thing I posted on Blackboard, so under the exam, there's um, the topics, so all of these sections are completely fair game. Um, and I kind of try to write down the things from the section that you want to know how to do. So from section 2.2, you want to know how to find the union intersection complement power set Cartesian power product, that kind of idea. David is saying that he is willing to do study groups tonight or tomorrow. Can we go over 14? Um, are you talking about the homework? I'm assuming. Let me pull that up really quick. Um, I should have had this up already, probably. So let me get over there to number 17. And yes, we can go over that. Do do do. Oh, I haven't. I haven't been able to grade your quizzes yet. I will post the answers to the quizzes so you can at least see the answers to it and I hope to have them done um, soon as well. Uh, we'll go here and then number 17. Let me pull up one note, one note, and then share it. Yes, we all figure out, get together. <laughs> Seventeen. So. So I have a generic one pulled up. Your numbers might be different than mine, but the process is going to be the same. So. So I think the 2x should be the same, but you might have something besides plus 7 and you might have something um, besides minus 4. Um, yeah, group me would probably be a good idea if y'all want to try to set something up. But OK, so question 17 on the homework says define a function from the integers to the integers cross integers. So. First thing you're asked to do is prove. F is one to one. Oh, sorry, or disprove. Um, so let's look at that just kind of generically first and then. Um, go from there and filling it out on here. 
So if we'd want some f of b to be equal to some f of a, we'd essentially need that the coordinate pair, um, whoops, parenthesis in the wrong spot, would be equal to the coordinate pair, this. Now, it even says this in the, about halfway down this problem, it says in order for the two ordered pairs to be equal, an item of one ordered pair must be equal to the corresponding term in the other ordered pair, which is to say that essentially we would need this 2a plus 7 to be equal to 2b plus 7. And that a minus 4 to be equal to b minus 4. In both cases, it is clear that essentially if we work from here, we would subtract 7 from both sides and divide both sides by 2. So we get out that a equals b. And from here, we would add 4 to both sides and get that a equals b. So I've skipped the first two blanks on that homework question, but in this third, fourth, and so on, we have that 2a plus 7 in my case equals 2b plus 7, and a minus 4 equals b minus 4. And it says in both cases, after simplifying, it is clear that a equals b, therefore f is 1 to 1. And then if we go back up to kind of those first blanks that I skipped, we would select that the function is 1 to 1. And for that kind of second blank, this is what you would be looking to write in. That's essentially setting up the f of a equals f of b, um, which I wrote this in the wrong a, b. So kind of what I have circled box, if you will, um, is what you would need in those boxes. Does that make sense? Um, read, uh, last name read, person who was asking that. Does that make sense? The one to one yeah. thing? Cool. Yes, that makes sense. All right. Then we got to do part B. <laughs> so part B is proving or disproving, yeah, that it's onto. So onto question mark. So essentially for onto, we would want, um, to essentially start, what do they do? What do they use? Um, um, how do I want to say this? <sighs> so we're going to start with an output. An output's going to come from z cross z, so we'd have some, you know, x, y, where x and y are both integers. And we want to know, does this come from some 2a plus 7a minus 4? And I put parentheses where I shouldn't have. So essentially, for whatever I plug in here, can I get out absolutely any coordinate point that I ask for? So is there absolutely any coordinate point that would work here? So let's start looking at what they kind of set up for our answer here. So it says the function blank onto because there is no x. So they say no x in the integers such that. Now your numbers might be different again f of x equals 2x plus 7, x minus 4. For mine, they're giving me negative and negative 2. So they're essentially saying that there's no x value that will get me negative 2 common negative 2 there. And then they say, so in this case, that box should be is not because they're essentially giving us, they're setting up this um, counter example. Suppose to the contrary that there is such an x. So contrary, there is kind of abbreviating just to keep track of what they have kind of in that laid out answer. So suppose to the contrary, in that case you would have that some 2x plus 7 equals negative 2. And that I'm getting from, you know, I'd have to have this thing matching up with this point. So that's where I'm pulling this from. 
solve for X and find that X must be. So if we solve for X here, if we subtract seven, we get negative nine and then we divide by two. So we'd get that X equals negative nine over two, which will be in that one box. Um, so let me try to box the things that go in boxes. That goes in a box. The negative nine over two goes in a box. This cannot be because that's not an integer. And we were only working with plugging in integers here. Therefore, F is not on Q. So essentially, they kind of set up this counter example of they found an integer. Phrasing. They found a coordinate point. That cannot come from an integer. So 2x plus 7 being equal to negative 2 cannot happen when x has to be an integer. But to be on to, we would have to essentially have every integer coordinate point being possible. Does that make any sense? Yes, that makes sense. Cool. So that's kind of what you were looking at for number 17. That one took a while. I had to pull it up too. Um, All right, so Gabrielle made a group me. Um, if anyone wants to join that group me for this class, if anyone has any more homework questions they want me to go over, I can. We've only got three minutes, but I can stick around for a tiny bit for my next well, class. This is uh, this is right. What we just went over is um, is this dark? This direct proofs, right? Um, like this problem I just did. Yeah, is that is that part of the um like direct proof strategy? Like is that one point five, I believe? So while this wasn't one five homework, it does kind of follow a proof structure. So yes. Okay. It's not really from that section, but this is technically a direct proof, so yeah. Okay. Um when will you have this uploaded? What uploaded? Today's notes. Today's notes. Um, after my my let I have a class directly after this that ends at four. Actually, you know what? No, I'll just do it right now. I just do this. Do it literally right now. Um, so that y'all don't have to wait until that class is over. Do, 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 do. And again, I'm really hoping to have those review answers up tonight. That is my goal. Notes are up. Oh, let me also put up the two two notes again because I kind of added on that piece that pops into the homework. Do, do, do. Okay. All right, notes are up. Um, I can put this this problem up too if you want. Sure, why not? I'll do that. I'll put this problem that I just solved, question 17 from the homework. I'll put that up under our notes as well. Um, in case anyone wants to look back at it. Come on. Right, gosh darn it. Number 17. Otherwise, you're welcome to leave. If you have any quick questions, feel free to stick around. I do have a class starting in a couple minutes, but I can stick around for a little bit. <laughs> 